Oh, thank you, Julian, for that. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kelly M. Borge, and I'm a broadcast journalist for GBC. Last November marked 10 years since I started working for the corporation, and when Julian realized this, he offered me a slot to speak today, and my initial reaction was terrified. Despite working on live TV and radio for years now, the thought of, oh, I started too soon, apologies. Gives me a little bit more time. Um, so because although I may speak on radio and TV on a regular basis, it's never really about me. It's about the news, it's about music, it's about you. Which charity is doing what, who's being crowned Mr. Bralta, or who's making it into number six at election time. What I did know is that working for GBC has molded my identity as an adult. It's ingrained in who I am today. And in the last 10 years, I've experienced some of my worst and some of my best moments at Broadcasting House. So where to begin? When I was 18 and about to leave school, I wasn't clear about what I wanted to do when I grew up. Unlike other students, I never had a clear idea about what I wanted to study. All I knew was that I was good at English, I enjoyed it, and I wanted to start making my own money. So I went down the unconventional route of studying for a degree in English language and literature through the Open University, so through distance learning. An option that was never really suggested or spoken about in school at the time, but an option my sister had taken before me. So degree chosen, next step was finding a nice part-time job so I could become a taxpayer and enter the world of adulthood, whilst also work towards my degree. A vacancy for production secretary in the newsroom was advertised in the Chronicle and my mum suggested I apply. Little did I know back then how that one conversation and that one little advert would change my life. During the interview process, I had to prove I could type quickly and well enough in both English and Spanish, because one of my main responsibilities was to be typing up the news stories while the editors and reporters dictated their hot scoops. Back then, a journalist didn't simply type their own work. It was a different generation. Nowadays, of course, it's a task that's become obsolete. I still remember my first day vividly, fresh-faced and naive. It was to be the first day of my career in broadcasting. In the newsroom, I did secretarial work, mainly typing, filing, operating the autocue for the Newswatch newsreaders, and at home I'd do all-nighters to finish essays and courseworks for my degree. Stephen Niche was head of the newsroom at the time and became like a newsroom father figure to me, and I'll always be grateful for the opportunities and kindness he showed me. He was really a guiding influence. Now, I'd only been working for GBC for a couple of years when on January the 1st, 2011, my mother was admitted into hospital. They'd found a large tumor and the cancer had already spread. Shortly after her diagnosis, I was asked to record a radio advert for a local shop. Its key line was cushions galore at the store. My mum had been tuned in from the hospital waiting to hear it all day and messaged me thrilled. She was so proud of that 10 seconds of airtime. I can only imagine what she'd think now. She was my mother, my best friend, and a soulmate, all wrapped up into one very special person. And less than four months after her diagnosis, she passed away, just three days after my 20th birthday. The suddenness of it, the shock, actually helped me cope. It was almost like I was in denial for a very long time. I was thriving, and people wondered what was wrong with me. When I was at work, I turned my grief into perseverance and determination. I applied for promotions, I organized birthday meals for colleagues, I turned up on time, I didn't just get on with my work, but I did so with a smile. I handed in courseworks, sat for exams, and passed my degree. At times, I was even criticized by some people for doing too well, like I wasn't grieving enough. But at home, I cried. I cried on the floor, I cried in the shower, I cried squashed up in my sister's single bed with her while we binge watched Grey's Anatomy for days on end. I would cry myself to sleep and wake up in the middle of the night with night terrors, screaming at the top of my, my lungs like something out of a horror film. I grieved for my mother not just emotionally, not just mentally, but it was something biological. It was a physical loss that's hard to put into words, like losing part of my being. There were just so many different layers to my grief that people just didn't see. So the next year was a bit of a blur. I passed my degree and graduated and applied for a reporter position in the newsroom. And to be honest, I hadn't given it much thought when I applied. It was never really my intention to get in front of the cameras. I applied on impulse, from a deep-rooted need to challenge myself and keep myself busy to block out the pain and to block out the grief. And so began my days as a reporter. My first interview was with a wedding planner who was doing some kind of event on the rock. And from there, I learned how to speak to camera, how to settle an interviewee's nerves, write a good story, follow up a lead, and perhaps most importantly at the time, how to edit on tape. Yes, we were still editing on videotapes when I first began reporting, and actually learning how to use video editing software on a desktop was a massive learning curve. 
Now, as we have a relatively small team for the news output we provide on TV, radio, and online, it means we all do a bit of everything in the newsroom. We all write our own material, we come up with our own interview questions, we record, we edit, and convert files into audio for radio or into online versions for YouTube and our website. I could go on about the skills I've learned while working in the newsroom, but they're really quite vast and quite varied. Now, soon after I got the promotion, I started court reporting, and this was a part of the job that I could really sink my teeth into. I covered offences like burglaries and smuggling, but I also covered murder trials, rape trials, child sex cases where defendants were accused of being paedophiles. The witness statements could be chilling and disturbing. And when you're in the courtroom covering a trial day in, day out, you feel like you're a part of the storyline. You go home and try to sleep at night, and you think about the witness who cried on the stand, or the victim who was so traumatized they had to speak from behind a petition so as not to face their attacker. As for the defendants, sometimes they could evoke just as much sympathy. Some of them drug addicts, some suffering from mental health problems, and some were just trying to put food on the table for their families and going about it the only way they knew how. I found the court stories were all, always the most raw, the most human, and the most real, but also the most challenging. Most of the time, I'd be sat in the gallery with the family of the accused or the defendants themselves as they waited to be called. Sometimes I knew them. Sometimes it was polite and amicable. Sometimes it wasn't. As I never went to university in the UK, I was grateful to be given the opportunity of traveling for different jobs. Although these weren't leisurely trips, traveling to cover a news story is grueling work. I visited the European Parliament in Brussels to cover some meetings held by the cross-border group with one of our talented cameramen, Darren. It was a fleeting trip, just one night, and I was up for most of that night, making sure my stories and my editing were done for the next deadline. But it was my first trip abroad to cover a news story and a trip I remember fondly. I also went to the Excel Centre in London to cover a tourism initiative, and I also spent two weeks at BBC Scotland in Glasgow in a Broadcasters on Exchange programme. Just entering the BBC headquarters was intimidating, never mind reaching the newsroom where there were hundreds of reporters working in an open plan office bigger than this auditorium. While there, I worked with eight different departments and went out on location a few times with the BBC news reporters. The main thing that struck me was how many people it took to put together a single short news report. From writers to reporters to editors, it was probably about a team of eight people per news piece. And they would spend the whole day working on that one piece, analysing and discussing every word used, every second of footage filmed. Which to me, quite honestly, was, was quite bizarre, because in GBC you're taught how to tackle every part of the process by yourself and quickly, because there's only a handful of you to do everything. When my peers at the BBC learned that we also produce a half-hour news bulletin every weekday evening, they were really impressed. And I have to say, I was too. I was really proud. The trip definitely gave me a greater appreciation for our little newsroom here in Little Gibraltar, and definitely made me proud for the content we produce on a daily basis. A question I was asked regularly while there was, but Gibraltar is so small, how do you fill a news bulletin every night? And I explained that during the slower summer months, we sometimes rely on those trusty beach features and the vox pops where we pester you downtown with our microphones and cameras, and we just have to make it work. Now, my trip to Glasgow also coincided with the 2015 UK general election, and I was able to help with some of the BBC's specialist programming, even saw the SNP's Nicola Sturgeon in action campaigning. It was then that I came up with the idea for the youth Q&A programme for our very own election later on that year, a chance for the younger members of our electorate to have their say and ask questions about issues that matter to them. It's since become a staple in our election coverage, and giving a voice to Gibraltar's youth, even in this little way, is something I'm proud of. One of the best parts about my job isn't the producing or the presenting, but being able to give a voice to the person on the street who feels passionately about something, and being able to give a spotlight to the many worthwhile charities we have in Gibraltar. As I'm sure you're all aware, our community's generosity when it comes to charity knows no bounds. I get to use a platform I have, whether it's on radio or television, to help charities raise awareness, fundraise, and speak about the issues that really matter to them. They do all the hard work, but being a small part of their journey is an honor. So fast forward a few years, and my dear friend and colleague Christine clifton Siler retired from GBC after a long and fruitful career. Once again, I applied for the promotion, and I was made broadcast journalist. They were big shoes to film. Christine had enjoyed nearly 40 years at the corporation and was a well-loved and trusted voice on the airwaves. The job includes producing our lunchtime news hour on Radio Gibraltar every day, and as well, of course, as being co-host and news anchor every weekday morning on The Breakfast Show with Ben Lynch. And if there are any Breakfast Club members in the audience today, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> 
So speaking of Ben, he's one of the many people from GBC who's turned from a colleague into one of my closest friends. And that has to be the most beautiful thing about my time at GBC. The relationships I've made with so many wonderful people who've become more like family. The kind of people who offer a lending hand when you're up against the clock, offer to work another late shift because you have a family crisis. The kind of people you can laugh with, cry with and be angry with and still know that you're friends for life. If I could choose just one highlight from my career at GBC, it would be making these connections. We've suffered losses and grieved together, laughed together, raced towards deadlines together, survived the most stressful of shifts, and also danced all night together at each other's weddings. And let's face it, it's rare to come across colleagues that you also want to spend your weekends with, so I recognize that I'm very lucky. Now, the last 10 years has been full of different challenges, but perhaps some of the trickiest times for me have been when learning to open myself up to being vulnerable on air. There's been a couple of pivotal moments in my career that have asked this of me, when I started presenting The Hub on TV seven years ago, and then to a greater extent when I started co-presenting The Breakfast Show on Radio Gibraltar, where there's a lot more room for the presenter's personality and sense of humor to shine through. And with that comes vulnerability and insecurity. You're putting your character and your personality out there for critique, and that's something I wasn't used to when it came to the news. News is facts. It's what's happening, when did it happen, who's involved, who said what, it's to the point. Sharing more of myself was a daunting prospect for me. I can tell you that as a presenter with every broadcast, it feels like you're giving away another little piece of yourself. And to this day, I still struggle with insecurities on a daily basis. With practically every link, I will second guess myself. I often think, oh, that was so not funny, or Kelly, remember, you're on air, remember what you're saying. <laughs> um, I mean, I must be doing something right because I haven't got rid of me yet, but those whispers of self-doubt are definitely something I still deal with. Then there are the days where the pressure of being on, of being present and quick on my feet can seem like too much. Days when maybe it's the anniversary of my mum's death or I'm worried about a family member who's ill or just having a tough day like anyone will have. And on those days, it can be a struggle to be on air. You just have to do it, it's part and parcel of the job. And somehow I do always find that after a live broadcast, my mood has improved. And even if it's just for a few hours, those problems are pushed to the back of my mind and all that matters is the show, is the listener and the viewer at home. Even just one of our regular listeners calling into the radio studio to enter a competition or to ask how we are, it makes, is that one of our listeners now calling? <laughs> <laughs> but even if it's just one of our regular listeners calling into the studio to enter a competition or to ask how we are, it makes such a difference. And it reminds me that perhaps they're also having a bad day and we're helping each other. Maybe they're also sad or lonely and being able to keep them company via the airwaves is something really special and, and it's a great privilege. So that's the emotional and the mental side of things. Don't get me started on trying to read a news bulletin with a blocked nose or a cough, because that is a real skill, I'll tell you. <laughs> now, up until recently, I was the youngest member of the newsroom for years. So as a very young woman, I felt like I had a lot to prove. This was sometimes exasperated by comments from the public. In person, face to face, it's always, you look much fatter on camera than in person. You'd be surprised how often I get that one. Online, it was, she's not clever enough. She's pretty, but she shouldn't be interviewing people. And don't get me wrong, the lovely comments and the feedback far outweigh the negative. But of course, it was the negative ones that get under my skin and push me even further to work hard, go above and beyond, and prove myself. So perhaps I should thank the naysayers as they push me to succeed. But there are just so many things I feel grateful for. The thrill of being live is like no other, a natural high when you've been racing against the clock and managed to get your story out on air just in time, when you edit your piece just how you envisaged it, or when a stranger stops you in the street to say they listen to The Breakfast Show and you make them happy. I get up before the crack of dawn every weekday, and on Wednesdays, for example, I'm in the station for about 6.30 and back in the evening until 11. And I still drive home with a smile on my face. I'm ready to take on the next day's early shift. So I started working at Broadcasting House at just 18 as Kelly Ann Turnbull, practically a child, inexperienced and completely oblivious to where this journey would take me. Today, I'm Kelly Ann Borge. I'm married to a wonderful husband, Nick, who pushes and encourages me every day to do terrifying things like this. I'm a broadcast journalist for The National Broadcaster, and I'm so thankful for the 10 years I spent at 18 South Bank Road, and hopeful to take on the next 10 in our soon-to-be new premises. So for those of you who didn't know me at the beginning of this talk, now hopefully you do. Thank you for listening.